Okay. So I'd like to initially thank the organizing committee, uh, the chairperson, uh, Dr. Ahmed Sheaf, the co-chair, the co-chairperson, Mr. Yaqub, and the rest of the members for inviting me to uh, present this topic. So uh, they uh, give me this topic to talk about the pharmacology and VTE prophylaxis, which was touched on by many of the speakers uh, in the previous presentations. However, this is going to just put a bit more focus on the pharmacolo pharmacology part. So we'll do some uh, review on, of VTE, we'll review some pharmacological VTE prophylaxis options, we'll look at the indications and contraindications of the medications. So first of all, venous thromboembolism is, as we know by now, comprises DVT and PE. It is the third, the third most common cardiovascular illness after acute coronary syndrome and stroke. We know a lot about the efficacy of thrombo, uh, thromboprophylaxis. Over th we have over 30 years of experience. However, unfortunately, it is substantially underutilized. So it's not, not all patients are receiving the proper prophylaxis. The VTE does happen and reoccurs frequently once it happens. And unfortunately, it does have long-term complications uh, oh. such as chronic such as chronic thrombotic pulmonary hypertension and post-thrombotic syndrome. There's plenty of guidelines available from different uh, resources, including our local guidelines here in Saudi Arabia. Uh, but these are the common ones, uh, the venous thrombobilism prevention guidelines and resources, the American College of Chest Physicians, Surgical Care Improvement Project, Agency of Healthcare Research and Quality, Deep Vein, Deep Vein Thrombosis Coalition, the, ASCO and, and CCN. So we're familiar with some of these guidelines and these are the references that uh, we've been using. In this table, it's, uh, it looks at the uh, approximate risk of VTE in different hospitalized patients if they don't receive a prophylaxis. And this is, I find it interesting. So patients who don't receive prophylaxis, they are in the medically ill patients, whether they are heart failure, chronic obstructive pulmonary infection, the rate is 10 to 20%. And the, the rate we can we start seeing it increasing as we go into the surgical part, like general surgery, starts ranging up to 40%. And once we go to the orthopedic surgeries, we see much, much higher numbers, which can go up to 84%. Major traumas uh, also can go up to 80%. Spinal cord injuries are also up to 80%. Critical care patients, there is a wide range between 10 to 80%. So this is can it can tell you an indication of how important the DVT uh, prophylaxis in these in the in these patients. We've seen this uh, uh, virtuous tri triad by now maybe a few times, but this is the uh, VT risk factors. It can happen due to venous stasis such as polycythemia, increase in fibrin fibrinogen, blood transfusion, immobility after major surgeries, or venous comp compression, obesity, or pregnancy. A hypercoagulable state, uh, traumas, active malignancy, surgeries, burns, and so on, or endothelial activation damage, such as inflammation, trauma, active malignancies, or surgeries. Venous thrombosis happens are more common in lower, in lower extremity, extremities more than upper, and large vessels more than smaller, and deep veins more than superficial veins, proximal more than distal, and commonly behind the venous valves. This is the kind of the timeline of the, the introduction of the medications and started out with the heparin in 1930s. And uh, 10 years afterward, we got the Wafrin in 1940. There was a gap, a major gap between the Wafrin and the introduction of low molecular weight heparin, which was about 40 years in 1980s when the low molecular weight heparins were introduced. And after that in the 90s and 2000, and in 2000, we start to see, to see the uh, direct thrombin inhibitors and uh, the DUAX. So first of all, let's talk about unfractionated heparin. That's what we commonly see. It's a highly sulfated myco, uh, mycopolysaccharide. It is ex extracted from porcine intestine, intestinal mucosa or beef lungs. It's a heterogeneous compound and all compounds contain a specific uh, pentasaccharide sequence at the end. 
The pentasaccharide portion of that compound uh, binds uh, to the antithrombin. The complex of unfractionated and uh, antithrombin increases the affinity of antithrombin, which mainly inactivates factor 2 and 10A. So the this is the unfractionated heparin, so it does bind to thrombin factor 10A factor uh, in, in uh, let's see here, 12 and 11 and 9. The kinetics of it, uh, it does have a very small curve weight. It ranges up to 30,000 Daltons. Uh, the activity between 10A and 2A is one to one, and it is it can be administered IV or subcutaneous. The volume dist distribution of it is 0.07 uh, liter per kg, and the elimination is uh, enzymatic deg uh, degradation at low dose, renal at high dose, Half-life uh, of the heparin is 30 to 150 uh, minutes. It is it can get altered by uh, age, hepatic, renal impairment, obesity, or acute illness. Uh, we, we monitor heparin through the APTT or anti-10A heparin assay. The advantages of the heparin, it does have a quick onset and offset, and it is, it is easy to reverse with the protein. The disadvantages continue uh, continuous um, infusion that needs frequent monitoring. Next, we'll talk about low molecular weight heparin. Uh, so it's a fractionated or depolarized and fractionated heparin. It's extracted from porcine intestinal mucosa or beef lung, and it indirectly inhibits clotting factors 10A and 2A. So here, it's uh, the way it works in the 10A and 2A. It is more consistent molecular weight, so we can see the weight uh, in, in a reasonable range between 4,000 to 5,000 uh, Daltons. It's administered IV or subcutaneous. Uh, and the inexperiment can be eliminated renally with a half-life between 4.5 to seven. Okay. It is monitored through the anti 10 a uh, low molecular weight heparin assay. And the advantages of, uh, of the heparin is wide therapeutic windows and no regular monitoring needed. It has a quick onset of action uh, through the, uh, the subcutaneous administration. And this advantage is does not have a quick offset and partially neutralized by protein. Next is the uh, Fondoparinex, which is a five sugar moiety analog of the pentasaccharide binding sequence of unfractionated heparin and selectively inhibit uh, clotting factor 10A by binding to antithrombin. It is a synthetic uh, option here and can be sometimes they can consider for patients with porcine allergies or sometimes patients will have religious preferences to avoid animal products. And we'll talk about it a little bit more. So it's uh, 10A. It's 100% anti-10A, and the weight is much lesser than the, the previous ones. The elimination of the fundoparinex is renal, and the half-life ranges between 17 to 21 hours. So here we look at the VTE prophylaxis in medical patients. This is different studies that they've done on in exoparin, deltaparin, and fendoparinex, the Medinox trial, PREVENT trial, and Artemis trial. And they all found to be uh, much more superior, or the, the relative risk reduction was much better in, in comparison to placebo in the in exoparin uh, trial, in the deltaparin, as well as the fendoparinex trial. As far as doses, the unfractionated heparin can be dosed between 5,000 units in medically ill patients, that is in 5,000 units every eight hours or 5,000 units every 12 hours, in exoparin 40, 40 milligrams every 24 hours, delta parent uh, 5,000 units every 24 hours. In exoparin, there is no insufficient evidence to be used in medically ill patients. Fundoparinex can be used 2.5 milligrams every 24 hours and insufficient in offering. 
So let's see, these are some of the highlights that I would like to focus on. There is numerous clinical trials that have not demonstrated efficacy with the use of unfractionated heparin, 5,000 units every 12 hours. And therefore, the unfractionated, 5, 000, uh, unfractionated heparin, 5,000 units every eight hours would be the preferred regimen. However, although this is, uh, if with no evidence, the unfractionated heparin, 5,000 units every 12 hours, may be considered in individuals of advanced age and low weight. Uh, total body weight less than 50 or elevated baseline or APTT more than 1.3 or 1.4 times the baseline. In a head-to-head -head trials between unfractionated heparin 5,000 units every eight hours and inexperienced 40 milligrams daily, the regimens have demonstrated similar efficacy except for higher risk in medically ill patients, heart failure, uh, heart failure and ischemic stroke, in which inexperience seems to, de to demonstrate a greater protection against VTE. In these same trials, an experiment has demonstrated significantly less hematomas compared to unfractionated heparin. So looking at the VTE prophylaxis in general surgeries, so we have um, the all the uh, unfractionated heparin, inexperin, dasaparin, tenesparin can be used in most of the surgeries. However, I'm going to mention that, for example, the neurosurgeries, the unfractionated heparin is used at 5,000 units every eight hours. Nexparin can be used every 24 hours, 40 milligrams. However, the delta baron, tensor baron, fundobaronics, there is insufficient evidence to be used. Uh, you can, we can still use it in the vascular surgery, gynecological surgery, urologic surgeries. Uh, laparoscopic uh, patients undergoing laparoscopic procedures without additional VTE risk factors do not require prophylaxis beyond early ambulation. In bariatric surgeries, I think we have a, a presentation uh, who, who, that addressed this specifically. However, the doses are, are recommended to be a bit higher. So we're looking at the uh, unfractionated habit, for example, to be 5,000 units every eight hours. The uh, next parent, 40 milligrams every 12 hours. And the, uh, the delta parent can be 7,500 milligrams uh, every 24 hours instead, the, instead of the 5,000. The fundobarics can still be used as 2.5 milligrams every 24 hours. Okay. So next we'll be talking about uh, warfarin. So it is a competitive antagonist of vitamin K lowers the plasma level of vitamin K dependent clotting factors, inhibits the V-core needed to generate the active vitamin K. Synthesis of clotting factors diminishes within a few hours uh, by different factors and anticoagulation action starts in one to three days. So this is one of the downsides of starting warfarin. So you have to wait and commercially available as an R and, N and as an anatomy. It is used to be the most widely prescribed anticoagulation for VTE. However, with the introduction of new medications such as the Duax, we start to see uh, less and less of the use of warfarin, but it has, it has its place in therapy. And we still use, see it in the prosthetic valve, venous thrombosis uh, in the antiphospholipid syndrome, uh, as mentioned in the early, earlier presentations. And in, in many cases, they use it in history of compliance as it is easy to monitor and to uh, identify the levels of the warfarin. Um, there, the half-life of warfarin depends on the clotting factor and it has a different range. The, the shortest one is the seven, which can be four to six hours that may extend to a, a six, 60 to 100 hours so that in general warfarin has a half-life of around 40 hours ranging between 20 to 60 hours. So limitation of warfarin or VKA is unpredictable response. It does have not a therapeutic window. Uh, we need most the therapeutic window we need is two to three for most of the patients. It is a slow onset and offset of action. There's numerous food drug interactions that we have to watch out and we have to consider. There's numerous drug drug interactions and there's a warfarin resistance issue that we need to uh, keep, uh, keep in mind. Uh, there is routine coagulation monitoring quite and frequent dose adjustment. So we, we, we have to see the patients uh, more frequently to check the, the INR and to adjust the medications, uh, the warfarin accordingly.
Now the direct oral uh, anticoagulation, these are, they start to come out in 2010 and continue to, uh, to uh, be introduced till 2017. 2010, we had the first one was Dabigatran, followed by Rivaroxaban, Abixaban. 2015, we had Adexaban, and in the latest one was 2017, uh, And they all factor 10A inhibitors, except for the Dabigatran, which is direct thrombin inhibitor. So as I mentioned, uh, they all factor 10A inhibitors, except for the Dabigatran, it works on the uh, 2A. Now, the wax uh, have been, they've been expanding in indications, uh, but this is uh, focusing on the total knee replacement and total hip replacement VTE prevention. This is the remodeled trial, which looked at uh, Dabigatran as effective as an exoparent for primary VTE prevention following total knee replacement with a favorable safety profile. And this is looked at the trend 150 at once they need to return 220 versus uh, an exoparin. And they, uh, they concluded, that they concluded that both the trend doses are non inferior to an exoparin for VTE prevention. Uh, uh, prevention. Similar low rate, rate of major bleeding, 90% occurred in the surgical site, 50% occurred before the first dose of the trend. In the renovate trial, they looked at Dabigatran as effective as an expert, an expert for primary VTE prevention following total hip replacement with a favorable safety profile. So it's kind of the same thing. Looked at both Dabigatran, both Dabigatran doses were non inferior to an expert for VTE prevention, and some low rates of major bleeding were noticed. This and the uh, record trials, uh, record one, two, three, and four, they looked at rivaroxaban versus inexoparin in hip atheroplasty and knee atheroplasty. Uh, in, in, uh, so there we had about 12,729 patients were randomized. Um, and uh, the, the, they found out that there was the same efficacy and safety outcomes in all throughout between rivaroxaban and inexoparin. As we are given the wax, we have to also watch for the uh, drug drug interactions and we adjust the medications accordingly. So there is a, uh, the CYP3A4 inhibitors and the CYP3A4 inducers that they need to be evaluated and need to be checked for whenever we are initiating the, these medications or whenever these medications are added into a ongoing uh, patients. So in this, uh, and right here, we look at the uh, DUAX in uh, renal failure and our focus is just on the last line where it says a approved for creating clearance. So the Bigatran is more than 30 milliliter per minute is okay. Rubixaban, it's uh, more, more than 15 milliliter per minute. Duxaban data is not available. Rubixaban is more than 15 milliliter per minute. Now this has been, this changes frequently. So we'll see with, uh, I think the, there's a nephrology uh, presentation coming up uh, later. So we look into uh, the sort of updates they have. However, this is approved by the European data. Now, looking at the VTE prophylaxis in orthopedic surgery, uh, with the introduction of the DUAX, we see them listed also right here at the end, Dabigatran, Rivaroxaban, and Abixaban as options. So we, we have the Inexparin and Fundoparinex, uh, Wafrin, Dabigatran, and uh, Rivaroxaban, and Abixaban. So in knee replacement surgery, we, have, we, we can use any of these. Uh, uh, hip replacement surgery, the same thing. Uh, the hip fracture surgeries, there's insufficient evidence under, under a delta parent, tinez parent, and, and uh, the uh, NOACs. In the critically ill patients, uh, in, in trauma patients, the, we try to avoid unfractioning heparin, but the low milk weight heparin is. Uh, approved with a uh, with an experiment 30 milligrams every 12 hours, fundamental insufficient evidence available. Acute spinal cord injuries, uh, uh, the unfractionate heparin can be used every eight hours, or uh, an experiment, uh, whether you use the 30 every 12 hours or 40 every 24 hours. Still, the fundamental is not. Burns, the same, the same thing as the acute spinal. We have the 5,000 every eight hours or every 12 hours. 
and the sort of the same thing as far as the fundamentals not uh, not um, insufficient evidence. Critical care patients or critical care <coughs> have uh, the five thousand every eight hours or every twelve hours, and we have the wide range of the inexperienced thirty every twelve hours or twenty four hours. There is insufficient evidence for the critical patients with the 2.5. However, it can be used if the patient is suspected for it. Travel prophylaxis strategies, and this is uh, there's the non pharmacological part which we recommend to our patients, whether it is foot lifts or ankle turns. But the pharmacological part is low milk or weight heparin. It's recommended before takeoff uh, on the outgoing and return flights. And this is normally is recommended for patients with uh, whether they have a history or uh, they are with history with off medications or they are at higher risk. Here on top, the indications persons with previous VTE, thrombophilic disorder, severe obesity, recently active cancer, pregnancy, and so on. The duration of VTE prophylaxis differs based on the uh, sur uh, surgery. So the general medical patients can go uh, six to 14 days and as long as the patient is mobile during acute illness and patrixaban can be given 35 up to 35 to 42 days. In major general surgeries until hospital discharge, major general surgeries in patients with the previous history of thromboembolism can go beyond hospital discharge for up to 28 days. Uh, GI patients and uh, cancer gyno gynecologic patients beyond hospital discharge for up to 28 days. Uh, we see total hip replacement four to six weeks, hip fractures four to six weeks, and, and so on. I'm not going to go through the, the whole thing right here. So obesity, again, we had a presentation about obesity and we talked about this, about the, the ACCP guidelines recommends possible weight adjusted dosing in obese patients, but the guidelines provide no insight what weight this should be considered or what the adjusted dosing should be. So an experiment 40 milligrams of cutaneous twice daily has demonstrated, demonstrated better efficacy than the 30 milligrams twice daily in bariatric surgeries. Injections of an exoparin into the thigh it was found in obese patients to have lower bioavailability compared to injections into the abdomen. One study suggests that the, uh, that the typical dose of low with weight may have to be higher in patients with body uh, mass index over 40. So technically, uh, or uh, the optimal dosing of any agent for VTE prophylaxis in the morbidly obese patient is unclear. Clinicians need to use discretions weighing, weighing thrombosis uh, versus bleeding risk. In pregnancy, warfarin has been associated with congenital abnormalities when used during the first trimester. So therefore, which is contraindicated and we don't want to use it, low molecular weight heparin or infractionate heparin can be used throughout pregnancy. Uh, drugs have not been evaluated in pregnancy, so should be should should be avoided. As far as uh, hit meta analysis demonstrates the risk of hit of two point six percent for fractionated heparin and zero point two percent of normal care weight heparin when prophylaxis doses are used. Due to a cross reactivity of 80 to 90 percent, normal weight heparin cannot be used as substitute to and for unfractionated patient heparin, uh, unfractionated heparin in patients who develop head. Fundoparinex may be an option in patients with history of head due to low cross reactivity. However, there are reports that head can, head can uh, still occur with fundoparinex. The wax have not been reported to cause HIT, but have not been evaluated in the management of HIT at this, at this time. As far as COVID prophylaxis, uh, I'm sure there's a other presentation. We'll talk about this in more details. However, the prophylactic dose for all patients, so we lomarcoid heparin, fractionated heparin, fundoparinex. Intermediate dose is uncertain. Double the, 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 double the prophylactic dose, weight-based weight based dosing, ABTT-based dosing for IV fractionated heparin. Uh, a therapeutic dose is also uncertain uh, with these uh, low molecular weight heparin and fractionated heparin drugs. So that take home points, low dose anticoagulation is recommended for hospitalized patients at risk for developing VTE and low risk of bleeding. Low dose anticoagulation compared to placebo 
is more effective in reducing VTE rate with similar rates of major bleeding. All anticoagulant drugs will similarly reduce VTE rate and have different rates of major bleeding. Low-dose anticoagulation therapy is recommended for all patients with acute infection from, uh, from COVID-19. Use of increased dose of anticoagulation is uncertain in patients with acute infection from COVID-19. Quality improvement strategies as we, we want to enforce the uh, proper use of prophylaxis, uh, we sh should do more of educational initiatives such as this uh, conference uh, presentations and in services. Uh, decision support tools, electronic alerts, which was discussed also is a great, is a great initiative or quality strategy. Uh, it's uh, access reminders, risk assessment models, and prophylaxis to remind physicians upon admissions. Audit and feedbacks process, quality indicators, and report of benchmarking against outcomes from highest performing providers. Organizational changes into uh, integrated care pathways, changing from paper to computerized uh, uh, patient record. And finally, uh, looking at uh, adjusting policies and protocols to uh, enforce or uh, encourage the, uh, this process. All right, with that, I'd like to thank you.